<laughs> All right. Um, sorry for the delay. It's been a little bit chaotic and unplanned. So sorry for that. But uh, I hope we're ready now. <clears throat> this is Overs Copenhagen, and uh, we have uh, we are starting the night of fraud deception, where we have two uh, fraud professionals from uh, Danske Bank and Obal Pay um, with us. Um, and Overs Copenhagen is a non-profit infosec uh, talking community, and we try to meet like once a month, and that. Uh, has been a little bit on hold since the summer holiday, so sorry about that, but we're back. Uh, we'll have this meeting in November and we'll have also have a meeting in December and the, day, and the dates will be announced shortly. The way, it'll, the way it will work is that first we will have Zoom and Gabriel go from uh, mobile pay. No, you, you, you used to be at mobile pay by now and no. How is it? Yo, yeah, all right, well, okay, sorry, I couldn't, yeah, he, he's, he recently changed up jobs and I'm a little bit confused where he is now, but he's at well, okay. and he's, and he, and he's a, he calls himself a fraud crusader, which I guess is a, a fraud or whatever. He's in charge of all the fraud. And um, he'll be talking about the past of, or uh, past and development and what they've seen so far, uh, at least one of the cases, the cases they've seen so far in Denmark. Uh, and after that, uh, Ketil from Danske Bank, yes, he's a chief of fraud. He will be talking about money mules. And afterwards, we will have the two guys talking about how they see the future of fraud, what they expect. And this will be sort of an interactive session where you can type questions in the YouTube chat and we will read them out to, to the speakers. And then, and then, and then we hope we, you have a lot of questions and uh, and we'll all uh, yeah spend some time and and learn stuff I guess <laughs> yeah um, so that's it uh, soon can you uh, could you please unmute yourself yes I yeah, think you right. can and then and then what then, then uh, I'll share your slides so what's the plan yes okay uh, hang on a sec I'll mute I'll mute myself and, and uh, I'll just start. And Klaus, you need to wave at me if I if I need to stop talking. And that's in general, you need to stop me. Um, but yes, I'm uh, I'm Sune, and uh, I at the moment I work at uh, Mobile Pay. I joined Mobile Pay uh, three months ago. Before that, I worked with um, with Nets, and before that, with Danske Bank, and uh, even before that, uh, many years in uh, in the Danish police. A lot of different. Uh, areas of the police, a lot of investigations. <clears throat> That's also where I got motivated to look into the analysis. Um, so that is also the reason for me ending up in the financial sector. I, I looked a lot of, uh, or looked into a lot of data in, uh, in my analysis in the police and kind of uh, gave me an interest in uh, trying to, to seek out new opportunities. So after almost 17 years in, uh, in the police, I, I decided to leave six years ago and joined Danske Bank it was a part of uh, building up the, the fraud area as such in, in Danske Bank at that time. And, uh, and here, <clears throat> I think that maybe just uh, one important thing to, to say is that uh, in the financial sector, there's a kind of a, um, a kind of a approach where you have fraud in one area and then you have money laundering in another area. And uh, and that is that is quite normal. So uh, some people are working with fraud and some are working with uh, the money laundry part. And uh, six years ago, there were not a lot of people working with fraud. Uh, the main area of fraud at that time was uh, basically just cleaning up the mess. So whenever we had a fraud case, then um, well, more or less, uh, it was just a matter of, of helping the customers and trying to them, uh, get, get them to recover. Uh, and that has changed dramatically over the last six years. And, and Ketil can tell a lot more about that because he's uh, he's now heading up the, the fraud area in, in Danske. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. And um, I, I, I will try to be fun, but I'm not fun. And, uh, and if my joke doesn't work for you, then then you can just laugh at me. That's uh, that's not a problem. You're you're more than welcome to do that. I have um, I've gave uh, I've given my uh, my presentation uh, the very uh, beautiful name hyperching, and uh, that's apparently because every kind of 
social engineering attack uh, needs to be called something with Xing. And uh, what I will cover uh, a little bit later in the presentation is um, the news development that we have seen in uh, in uh, in the social engineering area, uh, and that includes a little bit of smishing and fishing. But and I hope that you are all uh, aware of of the difference, shings. Otherwise, I will I'll try to mention uh, the definitions of them as uh, as we go. But uh, but I just invented this uh, because I, I think it sounds cool, hybrid shing, and that was a joke. Doesn't sound cool at all. And if we go to the next slide, then I can say a little bit about what I will cover during uh, the presentation. So let's see. Yes. So uh, all this fishing is, uh, in my opinion, nothing to do with uh, IT or techno technological uh, IT security. It's more about social engineering and deception and manipulation of people. And uh, and that, there's a lot of that. Uh, and this is an area that I worked a lot with. Um, actually, many years ago, I started out as a carpenter, and then I became a police officer. That was the traditional way of being a police officer in Denmark. And uh, and when I joined Dance Guy, I didn't actually have any kind of academic background. And, and then I decided uh, to kind of pursue that. And, and then I did a master's in, uh, in counter-fraud and counter-corruption, a very niche uh, master, I will admit. But uh, I would die if I were to do something very broad, like an MBA or something that uh, that I would never be able to uh, succeed with. And in in those three years I I spent on on that masters, I worked a lot with um, with uh, manipulation and and the victims. And I ended up doing a um, a master thesis in uh, the stigmatization of victims of um, a specific uh, fraud type. And that was uh, kind of an eye opener for me, even though I at that time worked uh, almost five years in, in the industry, there was a lot of surprises to me. And I also realized that there's a lot of fraud out there that we don't know anything about because um, people, they're not kind of willing to, to tell about it. Um, yes, and Klaus, we need to keep the slides here. Yes, great. So, um, this kind of uh, uh, fishing, smishing thing is all about social engineering, deception, and manipulation of people, and and a little bit less about uh, hardcore IT technologies and IT security. And the people that we are combating in this area, they are what I would describe as uh, smart entrepreneurs. Uh, they are working very agile, and uh, and they. Uh, really true to the concept of building minimal viable products. Uh, they don't want to overdo it. And uh, the moment they have something that is not working anymore, then they will go back immediately and, and change it. And that is also a challenge for, for the industry in the financial sector, because we, we are used to working with uh, business cases and, uh, and uh, decision boards and uh, all kind of stuff to be able to take a decision on, uh, on, uh, new strategy, new approaches, and these criminals they uh, they build it overnight and they change it overnight, and they 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 work very much like uh, like business people. They look at uh, at their turnover, and if it's decreasing, then they will start wondering why and try to uh, further develop the the products. Uh, and then when they go live with the the MVPs that they have built, then they have a tendency to to uh, keep on developing. And then also have a, a, a mind of being able to scale it. Uh, so everything they do, they can scale. So they might start with one uh, test, very small test, uh, and then suddenly they will basically go for uh, all people in the country or all people in a, in a region like the Nordics. Um, but so far, uh, the good thing about uh, these uh, currencies that they are, have also been a bit lazy. So we haven't seen uh, a lot of development from their side as uh, as I expected when I joined the financial sector. I expected them to to uh, to move from from this normal social engineering scam to something like using uh, malware, uh, mobile malware, and so on. And to be honest, we haven't seen a lot of that. Um, so that's quite interesting. But it is because that as long as they uh, make money with what they do, they don't want to develop any further. So they are also kind of uh, you know. Uh, using the resources the right way, um, so they're not overdoing anything at all. Uh, sometimes that that's good because uh, you can experience that some of these criminals that 
you can actually push them away uh, from kind of uh, your user pool or your product uh, if you find a way to mitigate it. But uh, it's not like it's going away. It's more like we are pushing it around. Uh, so uh, these criminals, they work a little bit like water. They will just, you know, they will just flow and find the cracks. And when they find the crack, it will just continue to flow through the cracks until someone stops uh, those cracks. And that's really interesting to see. Uh, and, and that's also part of the development that I will cover in the next uh, in the next bullet here so uh, that's the evolution uh, because it is interesting to see them also grow in what they do and and no doubt that these people doing these type of crime they're clever they're really clever uh, and uh, and also uh, the dark parts of the internet have made it possible to you know buy this as a kit so you don't have to do anything you, uh, as long as you can find your way to to a dark uh, broker of uh, of a fishing kit, then then you're good to go without really being able to do anything. And talking about the the evolution of of the shinks, um, that's something I normally talk about for, for about half an hour when I when I present present this. But I don't think that would be necessary with you. But that's normally because people they get really scared when you when you start talking about what happens out there and uh, and i'm i think that uh, we could all benefit from trying to be a little bit more realistic and and, and not not kind of try to to build so much paranoia around this area uh, because fraud has always existed it's not something new uh, and it's completely normal that uh, when, when we uh, move to the digital world as uh, as digital natives and di digital citizens well, then uh, the forces, they will follow us. Uh, and, and we can see that. And I have seen that in, in, in the past, not only the six years, but the 22 years that I've been working with crime, that criminals, they are where the money are. So that's uh, that's a natural thing. And uh, and in countries where you can still use uh, paper checks uh, to pay for, then you will see uh, check fraud. Uh, and that is gone in Denmark because the checks are gone. So, you know, we shouldn't be too too scared about this. And this kind of manipulation and social engineering actually also existed before we had emails. Uh, then I think I can remember back in time that I'm very old, so I can remember uh, this before the emails that uh, that I received a Nigeria letter, which is basically also a kind of a phishing mail where someone want me to 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 pay something for them and uh, and and also just touching on nigeria i think that's very interesting because uh, i often also experience that people they they think that they, that uh, everything is happening in nigeria and it's always the nigerians that are, that are doing uh, some of this and no doubt that uh, in uh, that some of uh, the attacks we see in the financial sector are caused by by Nigerians, but I don't think that they are doing this kind of fishing anymore. I actually think that they they grew and uh, have become a little bit more sophisticated when they do. And uh, and also just to to kind of uh, say something nice about Nigeria, uh, we are actually uh, it, it's our own fault. We learned the Nigerians how to do that. Uh, if you go back to uh, uh, somewhere around the 1900 and the end of the uh, the 1800, uh, it was actually us defrauding uh, the Nigerians, not us in Denmark, but us in the Western world and also India that was uh, that was doing fraud in Nigeria. So we learned them to do this. So no surprise that they they uh, you know come back and and use the same methods against us. Maybe it's just us being a little bit stupid. But uh, from the real snail mail that uh, was in, in, in my youth and in my childhood, we moved into uh, to having the emails that were sent to people. And uh, and that was quite interesting. In, in the beginning, the phishing mails were more or less just to uh, try to manipulate people into handing over data that uh, could be abused somewhere. And... Uh, if you look global, then uh, the thing that they went for was uh, was mainly the, um, the card numbers uh, that could be abused online. But um, but actually, um, th it changed a little bit, uh, and it also became real time or live phishing, meaning that uh, we went from having these normal phishing attacks where people were just harvesting data, and they didn't look at it immediately; they just collected. And then when they had enough, then they would start to uh, to see how they could uh, 
cash out with uh, with what they uh, uh, what they got from people, but it changed into being real time, where the fraudsters actually abused it uh, the data in real time. So while you were typing in your card number, uh, they were capturing that and using it immediately on the internet, and that was because they noticed that. When they wanted to do larger transactions, they needed uh, the one-time code that is uh, sent to people and normally sent to people in a, in a text message. And uh, that was one of the interesting development uh, we saw that they moved to, the, to that one to actually be able to do larger transactions when they do uh, the fraud. Uh, and, uh, and this actually started a long time ago. The interesting thing about that, and I will mention uh, something about that a little bit later, though, and that's actually the next bullet. Uh, why why it developed uh, into that uh, real time phishing, and and also why that is a little bit scary. Um, and then uh, at the same time with the, the real time and the live phishing, we also saw a movement in in the in the SMS area, the text message area, with the smishing. So uh, when people became more mobile than uh, PC, then the fraudsters moved along. Again, they just followed the money, so to speak. Uh, and that's normal. So, you know, uh, when we see new things happening, uh, the moment that everybody use blockchain, then guess where the fraudsters will be? Uh, they will be manipulating people in the ends of, of that blockchain. Uh, so it's not going to go away at all. Uh, I, I think that we need to realize that, uh, that more or less we're moving around with a problem. Uh, the the output of the crimes there is kind of a static size. Uh, people need the money, and some people are living from fraud, and uh, and they're not going to get a a, a full time job tomorrow to to cover their needs. Um, yeah, so we moved into the uh, the smishing area, and then also a lot of other stuff. And there's a you know a high number of uh, uh, smishing and wishing and Harpoon spear phishing, spear phishing. You know, there's so many shings out there. Uh, there's a shing for for anybody, uh, um, and it's a it's a kind of a joke because what it really is is just manipulation. And then uh, just and that's one of my jokes I built in here. How we actually have seen in the past that uh, that encryption have uh, been uh, very very uh, successful in. Uh, in preventing some of these uh, types of uh, fraud, but I will I will get back to that uh, a little bit later. And then another thing that is also interesting is that um, what we also saw was that uh, that the um, the data breaches that were occurring worldwide, the very last data breaches, uh, was kind of moving these fraudsters away from doing the standard phishing where they just harvested data. And that was basically because the, the work that they needed to do to uh, to do this phishing attack where they could get, you know, uh, in in the Nordics, we've seen them get from uh, 10 to 1,000 cards out of that. That was just too much work because you could basically go to dark web and buy a bulk of cards if you needed that. So, um, so, so basically then uh, they, um, they didn't want to bother with doing uh, the the normal phishing, uh, and that's also a reason for us uh, seeing the real-time phishing because there's a bigger output, a uh, bigger opportunity to cash out with the real-time phishing when you get your hands on that one-time code. Um, yes, and then also another thing that also fueled it a little bit is the the EU that uh, that have actually uh, they have introduced a new payment service directive that is supposed to to protect the citizens of the EU, and that's really really good, and it's a good payment service directive. But uh, but in this case uh, that uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, I, I will try to explain why why these forces they are moving in that direction, and that is actually caused uh, due to the data breaches, but also due to that uh, that the EU have changed uh, uh, changed the game. They they in the payment service directive they are requiring a lot more one-time passcodes uh, on also smaller transactions than in the past. And that is uh, going to dramatically change in, in near future. And I think that if you live in Denmark, you might have already experienced it now that there is a new uh, one-time passcode for uh, for your Visa Dan card. I experienced myself yesterday uh, where I had to use my, my national uh, ID in Denmark, the NEM ID, to, to actually proceed um, and, and buy something with my card. And that has also pushed uh, the fraudsters in uh, in this direction of, of the more real-time uh, and live phishing and also the hybrid phishing. And I 
the hybrid version that uh, that I will tell more about, I actually see as as them testing how they can continue to cash out also in in the period after that this payment service directive with the with the one hand code have have come into play. And then another thing, and this is it, it's not a joke, but it's just to be a little bit provocative. So I said here that uh, there are no stupid victims. Uh, there's just a lot of stupid inside out IT security. And and what I mean by that is that uh, I experience all the time that people can simply not believe how could you be that stupid? Why did you click that link? Why did you download that file? Why did you send that money to Hong Kong? Why did you uh, type in your card uh, data? And um, th- I think that the numbers that I'm also going to share a little bit on later will reveal that uh, you know it's not possible that so many people can be that stupid. So I think that we need to reconsider how we how we talk about the victims because uh, from my experience and my research for my master thesis, where I interviewed a lot of the victims of uh, of investment fraud, uh, th- there were none of them that were stupid, not at all. It was very well educated and totally normal people. But uh, none of them shared their experience with what um, what happened to them. Uh, so I actually also I met a, a woman, uh, an elderly uh, woman that hadn't told her 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 husband about the fraud, and she actually lost a lot of money. And that is due to that they expect that we would point at them and and tell them that that they are stupid. And in in my opinion, I think that we just failed. Uh, we tried to solve this problem with more of what actually created the problem. And I think that the, that the one of the main reasons for us still seeing phishing is because we, and in in, in general, the social engineering is that we don't talk about it, and uh, there's nobody that want to share their experience with it. So I think that uh, that causes a lot a uh, lot of pain and a lot of noise. And uh, but on on the good side, you could say if you're uh, a service provider selling uh, IT security uh, equipment and technologies, then uh, then you're in a good shape because everybody wants to buy a new solution to to solve a problem instead of trying to get the root cause and solve it the right way. Then there's one good thing about the criminals, and that is that they, they don't discriminate. You know, there's a fraud type for everybody. And we need to realize that it could happen to us and it could happen to you. I guess that you are pretty IT skilled, but uh, I would also bet that uh, that there are someone out there that are more skilled than you that would be able to trick you into something. Uh, and if you don't realize that, then I would argue that it's just a matter of when you will become uh, a victim and, and not if. So, um, and I see, I, I say that, you know, I'm completely honest about that myself. And I'm also willing to share uh, the, the, some of the stories of how I got, uh, you know, how I got duped myself. Uh, myself. So I have actually also been a victim of fraud, not uh, not recently, uh, but um, but I think there's a, there's a point in that story. I'm not shared now, but maybe uh, maybe if someone asks for it, I will share. It's uh, it's also kind of personal, uh, but uh, but in reality, uh, there is no stupid victims out there. There's some people that have another an understanding of this area than than you and I. So um, that's that's the main reason. And the good thing is that they don't discriminate. They go for everybody. Let's uh, just before we move to the next slide, I'll just say that my joke didn't really work with the encryption up there. So what I tried to do before was to explain that we actually experienced here in the Nordics that we were kind of protected in the past. So Klaus, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, in the beginning of all these phishing campaigns, we actually experienced that uh, that fraudsters they they were not too happy about attacking us in the Nordic because we are not English speaking. So uh, our e banking in the start in the beginning was uh, in Danish and uh, not a lot of uh, English words in there, so it was difficult to navigate around for for criminals. And at that time, it was also uh, international criminals and not uh, not local people doing this. And um, and what we experienced was that uh, first they they had problems with it. So actually, uh, the encryption, our language encryption, uh, helped us a lot in the beginning, and uh, and it still to some extent is helping us, but only in one of the countries. And uh, you know, if if you as a criminal and you are English speaking and you are about to to log on uh, somewhere in an e-bank or a mobile bank. Uh, I, I think that it's pretty clear for you to see here which uh, which button you should push 
uh, except for the last one. And that's actually quite interesting. Uh, and that's the Finnish one. And I'll not even try to, to pronounce it. Uh, uh, but, but what we have seen in Finland, uh, actually all the way to now, is that uh, Finns are more nice than the rest of the Nordic people. Uh, and uh, there's not a lot of fraud in Finland. And uh, on top of that, they still have a kind of inherent protection with their language. The Finnish language is just encrypted. It doesn't make sense for, for English speaking. And, and then on top of that, Finns are just nicer people than, uh, than, than us in uh, Norway and Sweden and Denmark. But, uh, but it is an interesting to see. And, and, and for example, in the card fraud area that I also worked a lot with, uh, Finland was one of the last uh, places in the Nordics that uh, actually had the, the preventive measures uh, on the cards. Uh, so, and that was because there were no need for that because there were not a lot of fraud in Finland. And I, and I think that is, that is really, really interesting. But it, of course, that it was a joke uh, about the encryption. And, and I hope you liked it. Otherwise, just laugh at me. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's try to move to to the next slide. Then I think I'll start uh, with uh, giving you some numbers. And I think these numbers they are officially, so it's not something that I'm just sharing based on my knowledge. Uh, it is uh, something that I've been a part of, but it's uh, official, and you can find it uh, if you Google it. Um, in the beginning of December two thousand and nineteen, uh, an attack uh, on uh, on Denmark started. Uh, and that was a what I would call a hybrid shing or a hybrid fishing uh, attack. And the interesting thing was that uh, that they launched it in December, where everybody was waiting for uh, for their gifts for Christmas. So everybody was expecting a mail or a text message from uh, some kind of shipping company, postal company. And uh, these forces they knew uh, that was a part of their their business plan. So. Uh, so they, they, they I, I'm pretty sure that they waited uh, for this period. And then they launched uh, a smishing campaign. And uh, I have some screenshots uh, that I will share later uh, with the slides, uh, how, how that looked. It was very convincing. And especially when you were waiting for a patch. And uh, they launched that in the beginning of December. And then within 30 days, uh, 22,000 Danes uh, responded to uh, to the smishing uh, campaign so the text message and they also clicked the link and they also ended up typing in their card number and thereby compromising the card number and i think that to me uh, and i have seen a lot both here and in the police but i think that is a mind-blowing number how can you reach uh, so many people that are willing to click the link uh, because to me uh, when I clicked some of these links, it's very obvious that that is fraud. But nevertheless, we need to respect that 22,000 not only clicked the link, but also compromised their card. And I think that's insane. And the criminals here, they were really, really clever. What they did here was that they, uh, they actually prepared themselves for this attack. So instead of harvesting the data, and in the beginning also, instead of doing it real time, then what they actually did when you clicked the link was that they led you to a web page that they created uh, with some services that you could sign up for. So it was a subscription. Uh, some of them were a Brazilian uh, movie streaming service. Uh, not a lot of things ha have a need for that, I think. But nevertheless, uh, people signed up for that and it was uh, via this mani manipulation. So these forces, they actually uh, spent the time on on creating a lot of uh, websites and also creating a real merchant where they were actually able to accept a card transaction. And I think that is really interesting that they, they actually kind of penetrated the, um, the infrastructure and the ecosystem of the card world by establishing companies. Uh, and, and that is really, really interesting because what we see with uh, of the fraud today and also the fraud that uh, that this payment service directive I talked about before was supposed to stop was uh, kind of this third party fraud where someone obtained your card details and abused it uh, or someone got your card details in real time and, and tried to use it but here they're actually not taking your card details they are allowing you to type it in and then you do the transaction yourself 
And uh, that is not going to be stopped by the payment service directive. And yes, you can do a chargeback. You can call your bank and get your money back. But these fraudsters, they are away. And even though that you don't have a loss and, and your bank might not end up with a loss, someone somewhere will end up with a loss of these cases. And uh, and it's not the fraudsters. The fraudsters, they will have their money. And um, some of them are terrorists and some of them are organized criminals. So uh, it's not something that I prefer to sponsor personally. Uh, I think I would use my money uh, wisely elsewhere. But it's interesting to see how, how capable they are of, uh, of building uh, this total infrastructure where they can actually cash out. And it's really interesting, especially in knowing that in future, you'll see a lot of more one-time codes because what will happen in this case after January 1st, where you would have to type in a one-time passcode, well, you would type in that one-time passcode. And then we'll just have 22,000 cases where uh, the one-time code has been used because people will not stop when they receive that one-time code because they are manipulated at that time. And I think that's interesting. And I think uh, it's interesting to see how the criminals are actually already now started training to to do fraud in, in the period after this uh, payment service directive have, have come into play. So let's uh, go to the next slide, Klaus. Klaus, I'm talking too much. Sorry, just a second. Yes. Uh, I, th I think uh, you... You you said you're you're bad at jokes, but uh, actually you're very good at uh, building up expectations. People in the chat are asking uh, uh, to share the story that you wouldn't share otherwise. Okay, okay. Right. I will uh, uh, then. I will share later. Then I will share okay. later. Okay. okay. But uh, and then we can also ensure that people stay online until we are all the way through. That's uh, that's great. Uh, Cliffhanger. So. Um, this was um, what you uh, experienced, that you, you got this text message and uh, it said that it was from uh, the our national uh, and, by the way, also the Swedish national postal company. And when you click the link, uh, you arrived at a web page looking like this. And then you should just type in that package number that you also had in, uh, in the text message you got. And then you could actually search for it. And this is, you know, it looks completely like the, the Postal Service web page looked at that time. So if we go to the next slide, then you can see that uh, then we have searched for our package that does not exist. And it's on its way. So everything is good. Uh, but there's just one thing uh, you're just missing to, to pay 20 krona for that. So, uh, so here... Uh, you're now interested when and uh, what is what is all this about and uh, I need to pay for this package in this uh, in this campaign I'm not really sure what they they told about the package but in some of the other campaigns they told you that you you want an iPhone or you want a a, um, a Samsung phone and you just had to pay for the postal so it was one euro for for some of them and uh, and and you'll be surprised that uh, pe people are willing to do that they believe that they want that. Uh, and, and don't judge them, don't call them stupid. Just remember that they have another understanding of the internet than we do. And uh, and that's also interesting. And, and I will get back to that, another cliffhanger. If we go to the next slide, then um, you can see here that um, you have to pay the, the 20 krona. And, uh, and you could do that by clicking. And if we go to the next slide, then you can see that uh, the, these forces, and this is the forces that created this site, and it's uh, protected by an autumn. It's really, really good. And it's also PCI compliant. And we, uh, I think me and Casey are very happy to see that Frosters are working uh, PCI compliant, meaning that they are taking care of our card data and ensuring that it's not, it's not compromised. And in this case, it was actually PCI compliant because the Frosters were not obtaining your card data. They got a lot of information about you here because here you type in your, your name and your address and phone number and all that stuff. And that's also interesting because that is also what we have seen in some of the cases where the forces they have uh, they have actually been using some of the data that they have either bought on the dark web or obtained from some data breach and tried to build up a kind of cover story that could convince you into doing some, something. And that's in some of the cases where they actually call you and then they have some knowledge about you before and they might have uh, gotten this either from you tapping into this phishing campaign, giving away all the details about yourself, maybe even your mother's maiden name, and uh, and then they will use it. And, and for these data that you type in here, 
then the forces they they obtain that, and then they know that you are prone to respond to a phishing mail. So let's try let's try and call this person and see if we can get more out of this person with all the, the information we obtain. So so this part here, they captured a lot of data about you, and then if we go to the next slide, then uh, then you actually had to uh, to pay for. Uh, uh, for the parcel, yeah, we can we can move to the next slide. And here you had to type in uh, your full card number with the expiry date and and uh, the CVV uh, or CVC code uh, that is on the back of the card. And uh, in this case, I have not seen a proof of that they actually uh, compromised your card data. They simply used the card infrastructure uh, with their companies just to do uh, a genuine transaction. Um, and that's interesting. Uh, they, I, I don't think that they're, they're in need for card data. There's so much card data for sale out there that it's uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, so many cards out there, uh, and uh, that is also due to some of the exciting data breaches and and another cliffhanger, uh, and also to get some some traffic on my LinkedIn site. Uh, maybe later today or early morning, I will post a. Uh, a write-up that I have been doing about a uh, data compromise uh, that we see uh, and we have been seeing for a couple of years, and it's uh, it's still ongoing in in different versions. And that's interesting because that's where data is just flowing. So the, it's a like a land of milk and honey with data for these criminals. So they don't need to take this card data when they have the infrastructure and they are capable of taking your payment. Then they will just do that, and then they will sign you up for a subscription. And uh, then you could say, but why would they do that? I would just, uh, you know, uh, either block my card or I try to get out of that subscription. But these criminals, they actually don't care uh, whether you do that uh, because they, they're just in it for what they can get. So if you, for example, pay only one uh, of these subscriptions, then that's fine. Then there might be others that do not realize it and keep on paying this amount for uh, for maybe a month or maybe years without realizing. And then they're just earning uh, a lot of money. Yes, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, we can jump to uh, the next again. Yes, so this is one of the examples. And uh, to me, it seemed like that uh, that these 200 merchants that they created, they just built a kind of a randomizer uh, coming up with some names for companies because there were no meaning in what uh, the com companies were called. So you can see here that they, when, uh, when you see on your bank statement that you had uh, withdrawn... Uh, uh, 69 Danish kroner, then uh, then you can see the the name of the company, and that was ndebay.com. And then you would go and search for that. And then you will end up in this page. Uh, and that is also interesting because this is where it gets fun because uh, you can actually contact this company to get rid of your subscription. And in some of the cases where people did that, then their cards were compromised because then they had to give away over the phone the card number once more, and then the compromise happened. And then if we go to the next slide, this is just another example of uh, of one of the companies that uh, that you when you see your bank st statement, then you search for for that uh, d g e a m e dot com, and uh, and then you will end up and at this page where where they are also more than willing to help you. And the, the next slide, uh, it gives even worse. I think that their randomizer is running out of, uh, of good names. So now we end up with, uh, with names like this. And uh, yes, and if we go to the next slide, and then there's also some fun stuff in here, but I will get to that. Uh, just more examples. Uh, and we can move to the next slide. More examples of these 200 companies. And uh, you know they they actually did their homework, so they actually created these web pages. So if you search for it, you will find it. It exists. And then uh, the next slide, just almost the last example, but the next one is actually a little bit. I don't know if it's fun, but it's interesting because uh, this is a subscription that you might uh, would like to cancel, or you could have a problem with explaining it to your wife, why you have a subscription for this company here. And let's go to the next slide. Because not all of these forces are very nice. So, so actually also some of these statements uh, had this uh, this name on it. And um, yeah, 
you know, it's not uh, it's not wrong to be gay or anything, but uh, but I think that this could cause some problems in uh, in people's personal life uh, if the wife suddenly sees that you have a, a a withdrawal or a transaction on your card from uh, from gay porn is hot. Uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, that's kind of interesting, and that is also some of uh, the the tricks that they use to to put in stuff like this. Yes, so. Let's go to the next slide, and there's there's some text there, and, and it's okay to read it. Uh, I cannot manage to stop you anyway. But the interesting thing, and that is back to my pointing fingers, is that two thirds of these twenty two thousand people they were below forty, and that is interesting. And that's an interesting thing I have seen before with the, the mobile. So when you hit people on the mobile, then you will be surprised by how young. Uh, the victims are. We have seen it in a malware case in the past where all the malware victims of mobile malware, they they were also below 40 years. And I think it's a mix of that maybe not all elderly people are using mobile phone for, for the same things as, as the, the younger people. I'm not below 40, so I'm not a part of this victim group here. Um, but it is interesting. And uh, I also think that there's a, there's a kind of a, a lack of understanding with uh, with very young people that uh, that a lot of them believe that you know if it's happening on my phone then I can click that link and I can do whatever because it's my phone and it's in, in my pocket uh, so nothing bad can can happen but so, uh, sooner a question to you uh, on, on this one because I have more or less the same statistics uh, for for the mule part yeah but isn't it uh, something that you often get you often hear from others that young people uh, know how to navigate within, uh, you know, the, the the new media, the new phones, the new uh, smart way of paying. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as, uh, let's say, the, the 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 lack that we have here, or, or why is it that we are looking into these below forty years? Just your your view. Yeah, yeah. So, my, so my view on this would be that um, I think that the elderly segment they might not be that active on the mobile, or at least in the past they haven't been. So that could be a part of the explanation. The other thing is that I think that a lot of the elderly people, and especially maybe my parents, they they have a more critical mind than my kids, and uh, and maybe also me. So I think that they, when they then go mobile, I think that maybe they will bring in that critical mind. And I think that young people, they are, you know, they are trusting and our society is built on trust. So they just bring in that trust from the real world uh, to, to the mobile world. And and then I also think that um, maybe it's also something about, with you know, if you are sitting in front of your personal computer, then then you feel that there's a screen and there's a keyboard and it's connected and, and there's a power plug over here. So, you know, that is kind of distance, but the mobile phone, that's a part of you, you know, it's almost, and, and I'm not better. So my phone is always in my hand, you know, so it's a part of my body. So I trust it. I can do anything here. Uh, and it is interesting to see. So I think it's a combination uh, of, uh, of both, but, uh, but great question. And since, since we are in uh, kind of an interactive mode, uh, I just want to relay a comment from the chat saying that uh, one of the root causes uh, of, of scams is that we, we cannot interpret URLs properly. That uh, typically the problem is uh, uh, you want to go to a certain domain and then uh, uh, you can just fake the, the domain in the URL if, uh, if people don't know how to parse it. And that's yeah. a typical situation. Yeah. Do, do. So I'll just run my way through it so Keating can uh, get some, some time to talk as well. But uh, in this attack, and that's also interesting, uh, most of the cases, they were actually prevented. Uh, and here in, in the Nordics, it was prevented by nets, and it was uh, well above 1 million euros that was prevented. And that is just in 30 days. And in the card fraud world uh, and in the Nordics, I would say the 1 million euro, that's a lot. It's a lot of money, even though you know there, there is a lot of fraud then above 1 million euro, that's a lot of money also in this area. Uh, but that was only in the Nordics. Uh, so these criminals, they are global. Uh, I know for sure. So, uh, and in the rest of the world where some of the service provider and the financial institution do not really care as much uh, for their customers as uh, in the Nordics, also helped by our uh, ombudsman in Denmark. By the way, uh, 
there's no protection for this. So I bet that these criminals, they have a party uh, on a global scale. And uh, then before, and this is my personal view and guesstimates, just to uh, be completely transparent. Before 2019, when, when this uh, was kind of uh, revealed and, and uh, someone analyzed their way to this, these, uh, this fraud type with the, with the, with these kind of wishing as or sorry smishing and and phishing mails where someone were tricked into signing up for a subscription, they actually caused around ten percent of all card fraud losses, and that's a lot of money. And uh, and interesting also is that around thirty percent of the cases uh, was related to this type of uh, fraud. And and another thing about this type of fraud, and then I will stop myself, is that. Um, this is a hard um, discussion for a financial institution to have with their customer because the customer cannot remember what happened and they cannot remember that they signed up for anything and uh, and maybe they were even not notified that they signed up for a subscription. So sometimes this ends up a, as a very, very bad uh, situation for both the financial institution and, and the customers because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to to be misunderstood uh, in these fraud uh, cases because uh, there is not really a sign of fraud because normally when fraudsters they uh, they go for your card, then it's a lot more money than the 69 or the 39 at DKK. So uh, that's also a, a challenge. And then I think I said enough. So I think that I, I will hand over to you, Casey, and shut up now. <laughs> Thank you, Sune, for uh, at least a very inspiring uh, stories. Not one story, but stories, at least for my side. Uh, just a bit about my background. Uh, I actually, uh, in my my first job was as a, uh, working as a fraud analyst, uh, looking into uh, credit card patents and uh, supporting uh, our monitoring uh, setup to actually prevent fraud for credit card uh, fraud in general. So listening into such a story that uh, Suni just uh, brought up here it reminds me of the uh, good old days when I was working in, uh, in that area. Um, good. So a, a bit about my background. So um, as I just uh, mentioned here, I, I have a, a fraud, uh, anti-fraud background. I've been working in um, within fraud and financial crime for the last uh, 15, 16 years um, in various positions. Um, I have actually worked at NITS, where Suna also mentioned this story from. Uh, I have uh, worked within uh, AML. Uh, the anti-money laundering area where I have uh, done a lot of just onboarding, uh, monitoring. Uh, I also worked in the collection business and then I worked a, a couple of four years as a consultant uh, heading uh, KPMG's uh, fraud and financial crime team in, in Denmark. Uh, and now I'm so uh, lucky that I uh, have a, a job that I'm really fond of, uh, heading Danske Bank's Global Fraud Management uh, Unit. And uh, now I will try to put some uh, presentation up and uh, please let me know if, if you can see it at some stage. I see it now. Please. Thank you. So <clears throat> now I'm so lucky that I'm uh, heading uh, Danske Bank's uh, Global Fraud Management and uh, I will just do a, a short introduction to what we do. Uh, what types of fraud are we actually looking into? And um, then I will uh, just use a couple of minutes on uh, what, let's say, overall threats, uh, not threats, but yeah, what, what is the threat landscape? How does it look like from, from our side? And then I will talk a bit about uh, mule accounts so uh, the development we see in uh, money mules, uh, why things are changing uh, from one type of fraud to another type of fraud, even though that uh, Sune actually told me something, uh, just told us something that uh, goes the opposite direction of what I'm going to uh, to explain. But uh, I hope uh, Sune that you can come in with some uh, good 
comments input and we can have, let's say, an online discussion on it. But I'll try to click my mouse and oh, that was too fast. Good. <clears throat> so, um, as this is a PowerPoint presentation, uh, just uh, sorry for, let's say, the uh, the layout, uh, some of the text is from, uh, it is from PowerPoint and presenting it on a MacBook that uh, doesn't really fit uh, really good. But even though I think more or less it works. So as you can see here to my, uh, to the left side of uh, fraud management, what are we actually doing? So we have this, we are around these uh, 100 employees. We are present in uh, the Nordic countries and Lithuania. Oh, I'm moving too fast. Uh, and also, actually, in uh, Northern Ireland, we uh, we have a few people uh, supporting us here as well. So, what is it actually that we do? Uh, so, overall, I'm just running through here. We have this fraud strategy uh, and uh, execution um, team. We have a fraud prevention and analytics, and we have a fraud operation. And if I start with the one in the middle, fraud prevention and analytics. These guys are the one that uh, Suna mentioned a, a bit about here, is the one who's actually trying to look into how can we prevent fraud? How are the criminals operating? Uh, which are the new fraud types, trends? Uh, what direction is uh, the, the criminals actually going into? And then trying to, let's say, do preventive measures it could be like looking at uh, limits. It could be on your credit card or you, what you can withdraw from the ATM. It could be on how much can you do transfers abroad by your account. It could also be what type of documentation should you actually add or give when you are, let's say, applying for a, a loan in the Danske Bank. Or it could be uh, something about uh, limit on, on your investments and other kind of stuff. So a, a, a broad way of, uh, of, of stuff they are looking into. They are, of course, also looking into what type of technology are the criminals using? How are we going to keep, keep up with the criminals in, in this technology arms race? So we are actually trying to pick up uh, new trends trying to use, let's say, the same type of technology that the criminals are using, trying to use that into our advantage and actually, uh, yeah, um, protecting our customers even better. And then we have, let's say, the fraud prevention or the fraud operations. What do uh, these people do? They are the one when an alert triggers, fires, they have a, a, a dialogue with the customer to figure out, was it uh, actually me who did uh, this, for instance, account to account uh, payment? Or uh, was it someone who actually accidentally got access to, uh, to your account? Or what is, let's say, even more interesting is the whole uh, social engineering, where we actually are in dialogue with the customer who thinks that they are sending money to, let's say, a genuine investment or boyfriend, uh, they are buying something that they think that they actually are buying, but they are not. And they have been in dialogue with the criminals for, let's say, several of hours, for instance, for doing this investment. And what happens here is that we have, let's say, a, a team of highly skilled people who are quite good at asking questions and figuring out, well, do the customer actually know what, what he or her is doing? Or is this a, a, a fraudulent scam? And back to what Suna mentioned, there's a, a, what was it you mentioned, Suna, there's a fraud scam for everyone. And uh, 20,000 who felt for this uh, card fraud scam, uh, are they stupid? No. What we see here is that, that it's people with all kinds of education with really high education and people who actually should be able to look through these scams. And uh, everyone is uh, becoming a victim of this. And, and one thing that we definitely are experiencing a lot, at least in Danske Bank, but I see also across the Nordic region, is the whole part called social engineering, <coughs> where the criminals is manipulating uh, with our customers to actually get access to their accounts and their funds. But yeah, these guys as well in the fraud operations, what do they do as well? They are in contact with the police. That is 
also the fraud prevention and uh, analytics team. And they are, let's say, uh, supporting the police as much as they can to get the criminals away uh, from the street. Um, so we have actually have some quite good, let's say, operations with the police that have led to, led to quite a few arrests due to the evidence that we actually can send towards these guys. And they do a lot of other stuff that I could speak forever about. And then, then come the, let's say, not so fun part, but this is actually something that you need to have. Even though that uh, fraud is a very noble part where we are uh, protecting our customers uh, from being a part of, uh, of a criminal scam, uh, we need, of course, uh, have to have a good strategy on how we are uh, going forward. We need to know what type of technology we need to invest in. We need to know how we are, let's say, collaborating with other departments. As Suna mentioned, we have in some areas, and that goes for Danske Bank as well, we have cyber in one area, we have anti-money laundering and sanction screening in another, and then we have fraud in a third one. And of course, the criminals, they don't care how they operate, they do not they, they, they just operate and find out where is a loophole in our, uh, let's say, security setup or how can I uh, cheat the customers. So we need, of course, to operate across every, let's say, channel as well. So one of our, let's say, main strategic focus is working in a holistic environment. So we are using the same system. So we are using the same data. So we're using the same technology and having the same processes so we actually can fight the criminals even better. I wouldn't say we are there yet and we have a long road ahead of us to be fully transparent, but we are getting there. Uh, and there are some good thoughts. So overall, uh, a good progress, but it could definitely improve. And then on the communication part, and that leads back to no one is stupid in this area. The thing here is, uh, as was mentioned before, that that our uh, we are at least in the Nordic countries living in a very let's say highly trust based culture. So we believe when the when the tax authorities, when the banks, when the police is calling up, us up, sending us a text message, forwarding us an email, we actually think that it, this is the 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 authorities or the right persons who is trying to reach out to us. Uh, and that is good in many ways, but in this, the criminals are taking huge advantage of this. And this is why communication is such an important stuff. We need to bring the message out there. And this is at least one of the reasons why I'm participating in this is to bring out, the, let's say, the messages that, that and create the awareness around fraud in general. And as Suna mentioned, we don't, uh, we ask often uh, individuals or companies who have been a victim of fraud if they want to go public, but no one's want to do it, right? And that is, of course, due to reputational risk, which I, which I fully understand. But overall, if we do not speak openly about this, we will not learn anything about it. And then I will not go so much into this continuously feedback loop that we are working on. You can just see how we have the strategy, the prevention. That was what I tried to de describe before. Detection, alert handling, and then let's say resolve. So this is actually when the, let's say a case has happened, we do a deep dive investigation of what did we fail in our, let's say monitoring system. Why didn't it capture it? or the other way around. If this has happened just for now, we are trying to reach out to additional banks if we can recall the money back to the customers. And of course, when we are talking about the card fraud area, then we have something where we are compensating the customer as well. But as mentioned, you can see here on top, uh, we have cyber crime, cyber security, anti-money laundering and fraud. And you can see what areas do we have the responsibility for. Card fraud, I was mentioned, payment fraud, so account to account, lending fraud or credit fraud, where someone is trying to obtain a loan, investment fraud, and that's a 
let's say a funny uh, part that could be market manipulation, but it could also be like a corporate fraud uh, such as, and you can see here, cooking the books. That is, for instance, if let's say Danske Bank is investing in a in a company where the company actually did uh, forward a lot of misleading information to uh, Danske Bank, and we thereby were convinced that we should invest in these guys. So this is an area that we uh, are just currently building up, and we are uh, finding a lot of areas where we can improve the existing process that we actually have. If I just jump one step back, I, I think you have an idea of what card fraud is. I think account to account fraud, you have heard about the CEO fraud and all that stuff. But I think on the, let's say, lending or credit fraud, that is something that 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 is quite interesting. And, and why is that interesting? Well, um, at least what we experience and what we see in this area is uh, a highly concern on this due to the COVID-19 situation that uh, everyone is in. So what we expect, at least going forward in the credit risk or the credit fraud area, is when these support packages will drop or the, the, the government overall, they will not uh, support, let's say, uh, businesses or private persons or any more, then we will see a huge um, increase in bankruptcies. And what do I, my assumptions, where do they actually come from? First of all, at least when I look into the Danish numbers, uh, we haven't seen a, such a low number in bankruptcy overall. Uh, I think it's due to the last 10 years. And this is because of all these support packages that are coming in. When we then st stop this, there will come, let's say, a period of time where a lot of uh, businesses are on the verge of getting uh, bankrupt. And if this is their, let's say, their live project, their, let's say, something that they have worked on from the entire life, some people will get desperate. Some people will try to manipulate their, say, their, their loan application to actually get these um, uh, additional loans to actually get things going. So, and based on, let's say, if we go back to eight, eight and nine to and 10 to, in the financial crisis, we actually saw an, an, an significant increase in bad debt. I think it, it, it actually tripled in that period of time. So we are high alert on, on this area. And then of course, the whole in, internal fraud side, we are looking into here as well to figure out or to, to actually monitor our own employees in, the, in various side of the bank. Good. And then before uh, kicking off, and I know this slide is extremely busy, uh, and I'm sorry for that, guys. I, I hope you, uh, you, 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 you're fine with that. But I just wanted to highlight, uh, let's say, some of the threats or uh, the, the concerns that I have within the fraud area in general. So, uh, of course, it's not a concern that we have like more, let's say, customer demand. Uh, but what we are lacking here is that we are pushing, uh, as a financial uh, institution, we are pushing uh, our customers into uh, working more digital. And a lot of stuff needs to be very convenient. So everyone is trying to, let's say, move their money faster, quicker, in a more easy way. The problem here, and that is uh, back to uh, an old story of mine, is when I uh, was a kid, I was I got a wallet from my father. He gave me a, a, some coins and a, and, a, and a note. And then he told me, you take care of this wallet. There are these and these tricks on how, let's say, pickpockets, criminals, other scams actually can try to trick you and give you the money away. My uh, concern here, and that's back to uh, to what was mentioned earlier on again, is that no one actually teaches the, the the young people 
on how to protect themselves in this digital uh, landscape and how they should operate. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, back to uh, Suna's slide, and that was back to my question, that we actually have a lot of youngsters operating within the digital landscape, but we haven't really trained them. Can, so, can I comment on that? Uh, yes, of course. Be because I think that is a really, really interesting point. Uh, and uh, I can really relate to that. Uh, you know, the story you just told with the with the with the wallet, the purse you got from your dad, because I actually been a little bit puzzled with this with my own daughter because she's on TikTok and st she still is. And then you can laugh. But no, no, mine, you, mine is as well. <laughs> yeah. And and the problem for me is that uh, how can I educate her? Yeah, I can take this from an IT security perspective, but I, I'm simply not able to get a grasp of what what is TikTok? Why is that? Why is it suddenly, you know, how did this become a kind of a currency, you know, of likes and followers and so on? I cannot, and I feel that I'm pretty digital. I cannot educate my daughter on this. So, you know, I'm looking at the school now. And, and that would just be my comment to, to what you just said, that, you know, I think that we need to get this uh, to be a part of our, you know, our public schools. It should be uh, something that, uh, that are taught in school by someone who kind of have an academic understanding of that instead of us parents trying to keep the pace with all these crazy stuff. I don't understand the currency of the uh, likes, no matter how much I think of it. <coughs> no, I think it's a very good point. And I, uh, so, sometimes so, when, so, I, when I, oh, I, I have an echo. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's me. I, I just would like to, to stop to, to, to intervene here because we actually have a project actually about uh, educating kids uh, 15 to 25 uh, how to be uh, more secure. Well, uh, to, to teach many um, a range of uh, uh, cyber security skills. Uh, so, well, we'll maybe talk about that later. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say, yes, I, I think this is really, really important. And I think uh, uh, that uh, having more education about cybersecurity also from a young age is, uh, is going to be uh, helpful to, to secure uh, more of our society. But let's go on. Thank you for that input. And I think that is just highly needed. Uh, both input is very valid. Um, and, and, and that is why, why I, I, uh, we at least uh, try to support as much in these education uh, as, as possible, right? But but uh, you can never do it enough. And I think definitely back to uh, your point sooner, go into the schools, educate from uh, six to seven grade. That is where we should start and repeat and repeat. And the reason why I say repeat and repeat is when I worked back, back in the days within card fraud, uh, it was quite common uh, that I, as a card holder, gave away my card to uh, the waiter and then the waiter used uh, my took my card to the counter and took, had it for i don't know one two three minutes or whatever and then came back with it as i remember we run uh, ran these campaigns on uh, not giving away your ca card it took uh, took around 7 to 10 years to change that behavior so again it takes a while, and I would just say repeat, 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 otherwise we'll not get anywhere. Good. Then I will just jump into the regulatory, uh, and this is this is the fun uh, part, at least for my side. This is a game changer. Uh, there was talk before about PST2. Uh, that is definitely the send setting the, the standards. Uh, there's also some fines from uh, the regulators. That's also pushing the whole uh, thing, but what will change the landscape as I see it, and definitely the whole, let's say, awareness from the financial institution and others is, let's say, the change of liability. And if we look into the change of liability now, I'm talking about the account to account, and I'll come back a bit later to why this is so interesting. But as it is right now, a lot of the liability within account to account fraud actually comes from uh, is that it's the customer's own losses we have here. And why is this uh, such interesting? Well, it is because it is, uh, if we look at the PSD2, 
a lot of the regulation goes around the cart. And it is pushing, let's say, um, the, the security measures up and it makes it a bit more difficult, even though soon is good stories for the criminals to operate within this area. And then what do they then do? They look for other, let's say, uh, areas where they can uh, continue their business. And what they figured out is that right now, the weakest link is the customer. It's not the IT system. It's not the fraud departments. It's the customer themselves. So they are scaling up on the uh, social engineering part, convincing customers that uh, that uh, they should transfer money from their account to another account. They also know if they are attacking, let's say, my account or my dad's account. This is my life savings, my pension. Um, I recently sold my summer house, so it might be uh, that money as well that they actually can attack or try to get out of me instead of a limit of, let's say, um, a, 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 a thousand euro or two thousand euro on my credit card. This is of one of the reasons why we see uh, criminals actually attacking more frequently on, on people uh, directly via social engineering and going for, let's say, the account instead of going for their card credentials. And the what is the changing in the landscape here? It is, if we look towards UK, there is that this liability will shift from the customers towards a bank. And therefore, there will be like a huge investment in these areas going forward. So that's a, definitely a change. Then, of course, uh, what, what was mentioned as well, the criminals are developing. They are, let's say, using this omnichannel fraud approach, as, as, as I mentioned before. Let's say if they have my identity, then they will try to, first of all, open up account, uh, then take a loan potentially have a credit card as well, try and then use my account as a mule, uh, that account as well as a mule account as well. So they will try to, let's say, attack the banks in every channel that they can to actually get uh, as much out of the information that they, that they have. And then of course something, and this is uh, for my side, but this is an arms race, not only with, uh, let's say, the, the criminals at, uh, as such, but it's also, always, uh, also an arms race with other, let's say, financial institutions, countries, and so on. If you are the weakest link as a financial institution, then the criminals will attack you. If you are the best in class, then the criminals will go to someone else. And that is the, the honest truth. And this is why we, of course, as a financial institution, should be on top of this game, not only to protect the bank, but more important is actually to protect the customers. And then back to the topic that I actually was supposed to talk about. So the development that we actually see, one of the biggest threats that we, that we see as well here is, uh, let's say that the criminals are now moving towards the Nordic region uh, much more than we have seen before. And how do we see this? But that is where the social engineering is, is not, let's say, in a bad uh, language. People speak, let's say, fluently Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, and so on when they are interacting with, uh, with our customers. And therefore, let's say the, the, the red, red alerts, the red flags that you got earlier by, by someone who couldn't spell or someone who spoke with a funny accent or called you up in English, these are moving away. And then what I actually wanted to talk about. So if we look at um, the development in Mule accounts, and let me just start with uh, the mule actually what what is it actually so a mule account is 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 a person who puts his account to use for the criminals they might know of it or they might not know of it and the purpose for the criminals is that they withdraw let's say or transfer money from one account to another to either um, let's say 
uh, make that, uh, that uh, money laundering track more difficult or just move money fast from one account to another and then withdraw the money as fast as possible. So what we have seen here, uh, and, and the thing here, what I wanted to mention here as well, is that the mule um, sometimes is aware and do it actively, and sometimes they are actually tricked to transfer money uh, on their account um, and just are trying actually to be nice to a person that they met on the street uh, and actually are transferring some money from, uh, from, from that person. So some examples. As you, oh, I just wanna first of all talk about the development and why this is interesting. So if you look at the index I've tried to put in here on the graph, we're going from 17 to 18, where we see, let's say, hardly uh, a lot of development. And then suddenly it starts in 19 and it uh, continues growing significantly in, in uh, 20 as well. And what has happened here is that the criminals suddenly, uh, or the mules that we have seen, let's say, back in the days, they were, let's say, more or less cross-border. But the criminals figured out, why should I send the money, for instance, to Great, Great Britain, uh, if, I, if I, let's say, got access to an account in Denmark, why don't I just send them directly to the area that I operate in, and then I can withdraw and collect the money here. So that is, let's say, what, what has happened. They are, let's say, and, and focusing on uh, uh, the, let's say, local market here. And then again, back to the whole social engineering, uh, the criminals are, let's say, attacking um, our customers. Then they are convincing them to send money to somewhere. Uh, and that could be an account that is a mule account. And then the mule go down and withdraw some of the money uh, to the criminals. And then the criminals are off the hook because what we will do is we'll come after the mule and say, hey, you are part of a criminal activity and the criminal or the mule actually do not know, some of them do not know that they actually were part in a criminal activities and others are, let's say, not so, what should I say? Uh, yeah, the, the others are actually part of it, but just playing stupid. That's how I could say. So a few scams that I wanna bring up here. Uh, so there is the scam that we see uh, quite often going on here at the moment. And now we are talking about this age from 18 to uh, 25. This is where, um, and it can be, let's say some elderly, uh, not elderly, but some, uh, um, some guys from the high school contact some other, uh, let's say boys, but because this is normally boys, that are a few years younger. And they contact them and say, do you have a credit card? Yes, I have a credit card. Okay, uh, can I uh, buy your credit card for, uh, for 500 kroners? And uh, then uh, if the police call you or the bank call you, you will just tell them that you lost your card. And then what happens here, I have a, a horrible example on, on this, is that a boy, a young boy, gave away his uh, card to uh, these criminals. And what happened then was that, that uh, the criminals had access to an elderly woman's account. They transferred X, um, X amount of thousand kroners to, to this account, and then they withdraw all that money. And then the police, or not the police, but the bank called up that boy and said, hey, what is going on? You have now, uh, op uh, not that boy, but the boy's parents actually, and uh, asked, well, uh, something is uh, wrong uh, here. An elderly woman just, uh, you, you just transferred an elderly woman's money to uh, to your son's account. Uh, what, what has happened? And then this boy do not actually know that they are part of this. They know that they did something wrong, but they did not know that they, for instance, was a part of a criminal activity where they were actually stealing a lot of money from an elderly woman. And this trick uh, goes on and on and spread and spread. And we see this in, let's say, in schools. We see this uh, also, uh, at least 
that is what I read recently from our friends in Norway. This is spreading via social media as well, where where people are getting, let's say, offers to give away their card, and and then they are using it uh, their their account for for mule activities. They are hardly getting any money out of it, uh, and then they are listed as uh, criminals. And we of course investigate this quite hard. The other case is the other way around, where uh, we are talking about the innocent victim here. And the innocent victim is uh, normally, uh, again, a person in, in that age we're talking about here, who were passed up at a, at a, at a, also a male in more or less same age, uh, stating that uh, they have uh, forgot their credit card, but they need some cash. Can I do, let's say, a, a account transfer uh, towards your card and then uh, can you withdraw uh, some money to me and then as a friendly person that i am i would say yeah no problem then i uh, and then the, the, we decided that it was let's say 5000 kroners or 10000 kroner and like 5000 or 1000 kroners that i would transfer and then suddenly the criminal transfer let's say 10000 kroners to my account or five or whatever. And then suddenly I'm standing here, I was going to receive five, 500 and then I'm going to give that person back 500 and now it's 5,000. And what do I do? So as a decent person that I am, I, I say, okay, uh, I will give you the money back. Uh, here is the 5,000 kroners. And then thank you so much for helping me. That was so sweet. And then Five minutes later, that person who withdrew the money was called up by the bank and said, well, there was a transfer of money from a, an account or a card uh, that has been stolen. Uh, you are now part of a criminal activity. What do you have to say towards that? So that's definitely an, 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 a big concern that we have uh, due to this is increasing significantly. Uh, and this is based on, let's say, that the criminals are getting much more active in, let's say, hiring mules, but also tricking normal people in the street actually to uh, become a mule. I think that was, uh, let's say, yeah, and, and, and what I just want to say here is that this is not like, let's say, only a Danske Bank issue. This is something that we see uh, on, a, on a Nordic basis in, in uh, overall. Um, I think that was more or less it uh, from, from my side. It's uh, a pandemic, Kizil. Yeah, it, it is not so good, I would say. And, 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 and of course, uh, the innocent mule, mules, that is, let's say, the tough part. Okay, sounds very interesting. Uh, thanks a lot, both, for, for, for the presentation. Um, I would like to actually start some discussion. So maybe uh, one thing we could do is to uh, invite those who want to speak uh, to uh, to this Jitsi link. So if you want that. And uh, uh, the, the next thing is, um, yeah, maybe I can start. I, I think uh, a theme here uh, that was common between uh, uh, you two is that uh, um, um, the, the, this this idea of the blame culture uh, about blaming people who have been victims of uh, fraud uh, that's that's a big thing and, and, and a big thing that prevents uh, actual effective communication of how do you better protect from uh, uh, from from these kind of frauds in the future how do you learn from uh, from these issues and how do you improve right um, I, I can see this. Uh, maybe this this is more just like a comment that that I'm making here. But I, I think uh, that there needs to be some kind of culture shift where we move from just blaming the the users, as you said, to uh, understanding that uh, uh, these are things that happen to 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 everybody, to people who are uh, uh, well educated, as you say, and uh, uh, maybe we should just. Uh, have a better approach to this and then be more open uh, as a society when, when things go wrong. It's, it's true that it's really hard to accept when, when something goes wrong uh, that you've made a mistake. That's a very human thing to, 
to to react that way. It, it's, 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 it's actually quite interesting. interesting. Sorry, I have an Can you hear me? Good. It's it's a very interesting uh, discussion uh, about you know changing. Uh, the culture and it's it's not very easy one of uh, one of the things that i also did a little bit of research on with the with the fraud uh, cases was um, that the reason for us pointing fingers and blaming people is uh, something that is called uh, observer bias and that is that i actually try to protect myself so if i admit that uh, you know that this person is not stupid then I have actually also kind of said to myself that it could happen to me. So it's a such psychological thing that I try to protect myself uh, and, and try to say that it would never happen to me uh, and it would only happen to the stupid people. So, you know, there's a long journey ahead of us uh, in this area. I think uh, UK is an example where they, they kind of realized this years, way, uh, years back in time and they haven't managed to change it yet. So the, that's, not, uh, that's not a quick fix. Uh, but we can start, and uh, I think I actually owe one. So maybe I should start by telling my own story about how I, I was, I was scammed. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yes. So, um, so there's actually more than one story, but I'll take the newest one. <laughs> it's also the worst one, and that actually happened uh, when I was uh, visiting uh, Stockholm. So that it happened in Sweden, and um, uh, and the thing was that. Uh, I, I came to the airport in Stockholm and then um, then I took a taxi uh, to the city center of Stockholm and there were a fixed price on that taxi. So as I remember, it was 250 Swedish. So that's like uh, 25 Danish kroner, not a lot of money. But then uh, on the way back, um, I took the same company cab uh, and I just entered the cab and took that back to the airport and then uh, when we got to the airport, suddenly the the meter in the, the the taxi was running, which is was not on the way to the city center, and uh, then it was fifteen hundred uh, Swedish or seventeen hundred Swedish. It was uh, a pretty big difference, and um, and then I realized that uh, that I I I I was duped. You know, this guy he tricked me, and and that's what they do in uh, in taxis in in Sweden. And uh, I actually ended up calling the police uh, and they, they arrived and they just laughed at me and said, that's how it is in Sweden. And I, I simply couldn't believe it because, uh, you know, that would not happen in Denmark. We have a lot of uh, wild west and hillbilly, hillbilly cowboy things, but that would never happen in a, in a Danish taxi. Uh, so I, I was so surprised by that. And, uh, and why did that happen to me? That's because I didn't, I didn't know about that. So that's that's why they could trick me. If I knew that, it would never have happened. So you know, it might not be fraud, but you know, I felt stupid. But in reality, I know, and I have papers, uh, you know, on that I'm not stupid. But I felt stupid and uh, and uh, kind of blamed myself for not asking. But uh, you know, I didn't know, so I was tricked. And it's completely the same that happens in in the digital world. It's because people enter the world where they actually don't know how to behave they don't know the rule of the game like i when i landed in uh, in stockholm so you know you could you could uh, compare my journey to stockholm with uh, my father's uh, journey on the internet it's completely the same and uh, yeah just laugh at me for that uh, taxi ride but i'm not stupid i i just didn't know that so that's uh, that's one of the stories about how soon it came and and by the way, last time I experienced that was in Mogadishu. So now I'm trying to compare Stockholm with Mogadishu. Can I can I just add a, a, a one thing to this? Uh, I actually think something that worked well, if we are looking into education and and a way of, let's say, being uh, making people aware, is due to the whole COVID nineteen situation. So when it escalated was a lot uh, information about potentially fake websites was selling this, uh, what do you call it, hand sanitary to, to the hands. I was uh, the, the politicians went out and say, we will punish people who commit fraud within uh, 
these uh, these areas uh, to, with a double up in sentence. Uh, but the, the media actually kept on going and educating people. And back to, let's say, when we are, because we monitor the, the numbers quite significantly and closely, we actually maybe uh, i think it was it is twofold the criminals were not ready for this uh to exploit it um but on the other hand i hope that all the attention from the media and the politicians actually supported uh the the, the public in not let's say being aware being more uh, being more aware when they when they did out when they went out and bought something online for instance that was just my point that i wanted to raise so i think the culture can change uh, let let me relay some uh, messages hello yes uh, let, let me relay some messages from uh, uh, from the chat um anders uh, christensen here says uh, are fraudsters specialized in their activities or are they doing phishing, except, uh, for example, landing fraud as well? Um, and uh, um, yeah, let, let's start with that. Do, do, do you have a comment for this? I, I could comment. Yes? Uh, so I, I think both types exist. So, so you would be able to find people that are doing more than one fraud type. Um, I, I have seen that in a lot of cases, and especially when, when you know, if you talk about some kind of the the low low life fraud cases, then mm -hmm. they will basically do whatever it takes to get the money. But uh, but some of these uh, people we have seen doing phishing, uh, some of the phishing attack, and I bet that they also did the smishing campaign here. That uh, that is a group of criminals from a. a a country in the eastern part of Europe, and they have actually been attacking Denmark very, very motivated and dedicated for, uh, I think the first time I noticed them was somewhere around in, in 2017. And uh, to some extent, it's possible to identify them and, and stop them, but nothing is really done. But they are only doing this one type of fault because it's just uh, making, uh, they're making so much money. But in other parts, we, 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 I, I think that it's it's highly specialized. I, I have some uh, examples, and, and one of um, the frauds or the attack vectors, you could call it uh, the mage card phenomenon that you might be aware of, that is uh, where a web page is compromised uh, and then actually leaking the data as uh, customers types it in. So uh, while you type in your card number in a genuine web shop, at the same time as you're getting your goods, you're also handing over the data for criminals. And that is, uh, that is organized criminals that are just obtaining that data. Some of them, they have a closed ecosystem where they use the data that they harvest, buy stuff online, then they hire in people as mules to receive the goods and ship them somewhere else to the other parts of the world. And others are just harvesting data and selling, in, uh, selling it in, in bulk on, on the dark web. So, so I'll say that you, you can experience people that are Know, very specialized and then you can also experience people that are very professional in the sense that they are actually able to have a kind of closed loop where it's very difficult to uh, to figure out who they are and and what they are doing so I, I would say a little bit of both there's a bit of both um, then I have another actually very interesting question uh, so the related to there are no foolish users uh, to what extent can user education be part of uh, the problem? And uh, uh, if it's that uh, if it's hard at the moment, what would make it easier? Oh, yeah, that's a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think what we just need to uh, look into here is every time we come up with something that should be easier for the customer, every security measure we put up, it's like uh, what I mentioned earlier. It's an arms race, right? If we close one loophole, then a half year later, one year later, even faster, then the criminals are adapting and then doing something different. So again, this uh, I, I, there's no silver bullet for this, but I think at least when I when I look into uh, my area as such, uh, we could improve 
of actually informing the customers that they are on to, let's say, doing something that is out of their regular pattern. Mm -hmm. It could be better in 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 uh, in informing them that now they are uh, potentially sending money to somewhere that they shouldn't, uh, like like just some warnings that actually comes up. The problem with these warnings is that uh, they will be annoying at some states and people will overlook it. But that is at least what what I see from the from the UK area, that some of this is actually supporting, and other stuff. For instance, if I'm sending money to someone, it actually pops up the name and the company and all that kind, and that is verified by the the recipient bank as well. There are some measures, but as I mentioned, the, the last one, and the, this is actually confirmation of payee that it ex exists already in a lot of countries. But then the criminals figure that out as well and state that, well, you should, uh, you will receive, like there's no match between the name of me and, uh, and the account that you're sending it to. But this is due to, we need to go, let's say, on below the radar so the bank will not intervene with the investments that, that we are doing. That could be, for instance, uh, the story and thereby I as a customer would ignore that warning and then I would send the money away even though. So I, I maybe soon you have some other good uh, suggestions. No, I think that I just wanted to, to tell a little story about, uh, you know, educating users because I think it's an interesting area. And I think that uh, at some point I, I was kind of a believer, but I think that it's a cultural change also here that is needed. So it's not about... Uh, educating people or raising awareness because uh, I will give an example of the lifetime of awareness. Uh, so uh, back in 2015 we, we saw a, a high increase in number of uh, wishing cases. So that was the Microsoft support scammers uh, that were calling a lot of Danes and then uh, just before the summer holiday, an uh, elderly woman in uh, in my local area she uh, she was in our local newspaper explaining how she actually tricked these fraudsters. So she just kept on talking to them on the phone while she was knitting in the background and telling them that she had to restart her computer. So she spent hours and hours uh, with these criminals without you know even having having a computer anything. She just kept on you know talking with these guys, uh, and and that is of course brave and it's great that she's doing that. Uh, there's just so many people doing these Microsoft ball games that, you know, this is just a small drop in the ocean, so it will not stop all fraud. But what happened was that then uh, that story was published in our national newspaper, and then it went uh, viral on Facebook. So just before summer holiday 15, everybody in Denmark heard about this cool elderly lady that made fun of the criminals. And then uh, we saw a not only a decrease, but the Microsoft support scam cases completely came to a stop. So we didn't see a single case. And that was three weeks before the national summer holiday in Denmark. Not a single case for three weeks. And then the holiday, no cases in the holiday. We came back from holiday. And then slowly after a month, it started escalating again. And then within three months, we were back to the same level as before the summer holiday. So And so I think you could compare that to a very kind of uh, very pushy campaign on uh, on social media that everybody noticed, but then forgot in just three months before they went. Uh, yeah, maybe because they went on holiday and you know and uh, left the brain uh, when they they came back. I don't know, but it's just to say that education and awareness needs to be rethinked. Also, you cannot uh, you will not achieve anything with the with the normal. Uh, e-learning where you have to do this tick box exercise you know uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking of preparing a script uh, that I will sell for e-learning so everybody can just pass it very very fast and easy but but it's not educating people it's the cultural thing that you need to tell and I think that what we're lacking is the storytelling so you need if you want to have people on board and start helping you protect your company then you need to tell a compelling story what is it that you're trying to protect against and why are you protecting uh, don't expect people to be able to relate to something IT security thing. It's boring. Yeah. 
so it's, it's something that essentially needs to be reinforced over time right um not not something or, or maybe it's a train skill maybe it's something you you actually uh learn as young or or there's also some 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 factor of reinforcement uh, of this uh, uh this it's list. like driving a bike yes yeah i mean yeah you 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 never forget how to do that but uh maybe you'll need some time to pick it up again uh, if you've been off for a while but uh, but I, but i think it's back to uh back to at least my my example from uh Mm. When we educated people in actually not giving away their credit card to the waiter, yeah, as I mentioned, it took like seven to ten years actually to change that, and it was like constantly repeated over and over again. And yeah. I think we need to let's say create that let's say awareness, uh, that uh, understanding and mindset, and and the the, the issue is uh, it is not something that is only in let's say in the Scandinavian countries. As as Sumi mentioned, it has been going on for uh, for ages, yeah. and and especially if we look into UK, where the the I know the banks at least are are having like in enormous awareness campaigns around this, and it's still growing. So so it's not something that we we crack overnight, unfortunately. Of course, but we need to talk more more about it. But Otherwise, I... we are not getting anywhere at all. I think there are big similarities, for example, when one compares with uh, uh, the safety critical sector. Uh, th these are stories that, uh, like if you talk, uh, I don't know, airplane safety, uh, this idea of uh, um, having repeated uh, uh, trainings for, for personnel, how to uh, maintain the safety of an airplane. And uh, I don't know, when, uh, when something bad happens, like an accident or a crash, uh, one should never blame the, let's say, the pilot, but uh, look at the root cause. And uh, this is something that's really deeply rooted in in, uh, in safety critical sectors like, I don't know, just operating airplanes. Um, and uh, uh, maybe this is something we just need to learn here in, in, uh, in, in our sector. And uh, the, the, the big difference here is that um, these safety critical systems are just uh, small isolated things where you can just train a few people and uh, you you'll get the safety that you need uh securing our society is quite a, a tougher task a higher bar that we're setting our uh, up. yeah that we're challenging ourselves to um to meet um Okay, I, I, I can see there are lots of comments coming up. I'm just uh, nitpicking here. Um, maybe, let's see. Uh, so, um, can you give us maybe some, uh, some insight how you're preparing for uh, the predicted increase of roads after the end of Corona support packages? Are there new patterns that you're seeing emerging or is there something you're already doing about it since you, you said you're expecting uh, this to come next? Well, um, at least uh, on the whole credit fraud, we expect an, an increase, as I mentioned before. And um, again, it's a matter of technology. We have uh, put in uh, various numbers of, uh, let's say, new controls. Um, but to be fully honest, we know that uh, the criminals are uh, collaborating. Um, and I would say when we come into, let's say, 2022, we'll look back and uh, say to ourselves, why on earth didn't we uh, use that parameter or, or that kind of stuff? But, but again, it will be like cheating with a tax statement. It will be like cheating with your salary slip. It will be uh, a cheating with, let's say, things that you, uh, well, you pretend that you own, but you don't. All that kind of stuff that can give you, let's say, a better credit uh, liability uh, uh, or credit um, level, then um, the criminals will, will try to do this. But but I would just say for, for this part, it will, of course, be criminals. 
but it will also, and that is the, the, the worst part of this, is it will be people who are desperate. So people who are, let's say, losing their business, their life savings, everything they have put into this business, and now they're going out of business, they are get, they will get desperate and they will try their best to keep in. So I would say the, the, the intentions are noble, but we as a bank should, of course, not support this. I think maybe just a side note from 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 my end is that uh, that uh, what we're doing at the moment is that we are uh, kind of breaking down the silos between money laundry and and fraud, and I think that that is also an example, uh, you know, that we would need to look into uh, with a with a situation like the COVID nineteen because I think and and maybe we are a little bit lucky uh, at at the moment because. Uh, the financial institutions have actually stepped up a lot on the money launder side. So a lot more is going on uh, to detect money laundry. And I think that a lot of uh, this uh, cheating with, uh, with, uh, with all the COVID-19 uh, packages uh, might be detected of the security measures in, in the AML system. That, that would be my best guess. And it would also be difficult to detect it in, in the other end because, you know, if you call a customer that is, that is doing fraud, then uh, he will get the answer that uh, that no, no, nothing is wrong. Just continue, and that is you know the main approach from the fraud area. That is to protect the customers. Uh, so so you're not you will get the answer that that you that you would like, so to speak. Well, there, uh, may, I mean, uh, there's something that comes to my mind that other countries uh, might have uh, might might be at a at a later step in this. Uh, let's say transition right because uh, we tend to be uh, giving out support to the people as long as possible there are, there are other countries that have cut support earlier than us is there something you can learn from what other countries have uh, have experienced um a lot <laughs> i i would say uh, uh, a lot we have a lot to learn, as uh, soon mentioned. The Scandinavian region has been, let's say, uh, a bit uh, not so interesting area to operate in for some criminals due to the language barrier. So if we, we look into English-speaking uh, countries, they are, let's say, more uh, often attacked because you can speak English in uh, uh, both various uh, dialects all over the world. So definitely an area where we, at least where I am looking a lot towards that is uh, within the UK, uh, all the various types of technology that they are using, uh, the processes, uh, you know, the whole AI machine learning, that type of to uh, that kind of stuff, but also the whole biometrics uh, stuff where you look into uh, uh, behavior that, that you actually have. But back to uh, another thing uh, is how, and, and Sune talked about how they are merging fraud and AML, which is a brilliant idea. Um, one of the, the dialogues we have in, in internal is how do we, let's say, collaborate even closer with uh, our cybersecurity setup? So how do we, or should we merge? We know other banks are doing that. They have like... Uh, good results and that should we consider going down that road and and, and explore that uh, area I definitely think that uh, there's a we are let's say to some extent set up in silos and that actually means that the criminals have let's say a, a better opportunity to uh, approach us because we are not incorporating all systems all data, all things, so we actually can protect the customer even better. That's an area where I think we definitely will see a lot of movement in the next uh, five years, at least from my side. Okay, uh, I have another interesting comment here from uh, Kjell. Uh, he's saying that users uh, should be skeptical to all forms of contact which they did not initialize themselves. If you follow this camera into the area where they have control, there will be a problem. I, I think this is a very, very interesting observation because 
typically, also in the real life, uh, when you are on the street and uh, somebody approaches you, uh, the typical reaction you should have if you want to protect yourself is, well, you, you can help the person, but you set the rules, right? You are, you are the one try to, uh, who, who, who decides what to do in the situation. Otherwise, you are just the, the victim of uh, whatever situation this person sets you up for. Um, so uh, this is something uh, I think is true in real life. It's something that should be also true on, on, on the internet that uh, if, uh, if you receive some request, I don't know, typical thing, you, you're being fished. So you receive a request to pay those 20 kronas. Uh, what, I, what you should be doing is not just follow the link that you're giving, just go to the website, to the official website yourself, even though there's uh, some sort of um, barrier here that you need to overcome, that you need to be the one active making the choice instead of just following the one from, from the scammer. Yeah, I think I agree, but it's just easier said than done. And uh, much easier said than done. Too. And you know, when uh, the example I gave, everybody was waiting for for the gift for their loved one. So when they received that text message, now the gift is here, and you know, people they just respond to that. They can connect to that. Yeah. And um, yeah, so again, I think that it's uh, it's more of a cultural change because yeah. those kind of uh, you know simple good advices they people they tend to forget that when they are in a stressed yeah. situation so you know friday afternoon the wife call you and said hey i'm in a queue on the highway the kids need to be picked up can you pick them up and then i just run out of the office to pick up the kids and uh, and then the phone uh, rings and it's you know someone who wants something from me and i will just give it because I need to fix that. It was Netflix, you know, they needed my card number and God forbid that I should ent entertain my own kids the whole weekend, you know, if they block my Netflix account. So let's get that fixed, you know. The forces they know, they know when they should connect with people, when people are stressed and when they can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, that is that is really easy to say, but it's very, very difficult to, to do in reality also because that, we are all different, so it's also you know. very hard to implement if you uh, have not tried it before, right? It's not like uh, this is something, uh, some advice you can implement uh, the the first time you get uh, scammed. You should really uh, try to to enact that behavior, otherwise uh, uh, that won't happen in uh, in the time of need. Um, let's see. Um, So how can we come? Uh, how can we help users stay vigilant uh, as uh, now with COVID nineteen, so many norms and rules are changing. That's a qu question coming from Heather, who is from Seattle. <laughs> okay, and uh, cool. and their unemployment system has defrauded uh, six hundred fifty millions of <laughs> benefits. Yeah, I I know this is not only a, a US issue. I know there has been some gangs I know in in Germany doing more or less the same who who got like an enormous amount out of these uh, benefit uh, system as well and how do we uh, how do we actually manage that? I can only yeah, from from my perspective what we have done is that uh, before these support packages actually came out, we reached out to the authorities uh, to uh, put in our expertise, actually, and actually gave them um, uh, a possibility to uh, leverage upon some of the technology that we already had in place. So they uh, had a, a, a possibility to actually um, screen uh, people who are applying for for these support packages in general. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not that uh, successful on, on that to be uh, very transparent uh, due to um, the, the, the authorities was not so, they were a bit reluctant in, 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 in uh, collaborating with the banks on, uh, on, on that one and, and us putting our, let's say, manpower and and um, and the uh, technology uh, to support them. Uh, so so. But what we then have done is that we have 
try to work together across the, the, the banks to actually identify, and, and that was what Suna mentioned uh, on the whole money laundering stuff, to uh, try to identify uh, people who are, we can see the support packages coming in actually in the systems and, 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 and identify is there something suspicious here. And we actually are obliged to report that to authorities if we think there is, let's say, a fraudulent activities with these support packages. But that is a really, really long process. And it is not, um, let's say, removing the problem. And it uh, does not, uh, let's say, uh, move away the problem either that some criminals are actually taking advantage of this horrible situation that we're in. So this is not uh, uh, the best solution, but it is a solution where we try to do something, I would say. Yeah, and I think you, you are touching on, on, on a very important topic that public partner, uh, pu- private public uh, partnership that is so important, and I actually think that that's also something positive happening in in our area at the moment. That the the police have actually stepped up their efforts in in the area of cyber crimes with establishing their new centralized um, uh, kind of uh, center for taking uh, reports of digital crimes, uh, and and they also reach out to you know get perspectives from the financial sector on how to prevent fraud with these uh, packages and that's very very positive that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago so so i think that that's the first step and i think that that's also a direction that we need to move into that we don't expect that the police should stop everything maybe someone should help the police uh, because in in this digital world you know, there's no police that will be able to police the whole internet alone so we all need to to do our best and, and support the society. Um, and, and it's just great that, that the society and then also kind of opening up uh, for, for getting some input from, from the outside. I think there are some really great signs of, um, of uh, collaboration. And I think the future looks bright on that one. And I think that's an important step. Cool. Um, so um, one thing, uh, there's one more question I wanted to ask here. Uh, uh, have you seen any changes in, uh, in how this malicious activity uh, has uh, has evolved when uh, with the with the new Namidia, app, like with this? Uh, yes, I mean with, with the application as opposed to what we had before. And maybe more in general, uh, I would like to ask. Uh, um, uh, if if you if you've seen any technology uh, that that's been introduced to to secure ourselves that shifted the balance um, a lot between usability and and uh, the security we get out of the system, so improved the usability a lot. Yes, I think that talking about the the name ID, uh, I've been tracking the the name ID f- phishing campaigns for for a while and uh, have also uh, had some insights uh, into uh, who and uh, and how many are, that are handing over the data. And, and what I can see in, in those phishing campaigns that have been running is that uh, all of them are, are the old versions of the MID, so the paper key card that are being compromised. Uh, so I, I think that that is very helpful. Uh, but you know, when we have the new name ID, meet ID, as it's called, and it will only be in the app version, then, uh, you know, then forces will adapt to that. And then they will figure out a way to bypass that. Mm. They are lazy people, as I mentioned before. So they are just uh, using, you know, whatever makes money right now. And the moment that we shut down for their business, then they will develop and uh, then they will grow in another area and, mm. and they will find a way around that. I think we have already seen, I remember, Casey, maybe you also remember that, some of the cases from Sweden with the Swedish bank ID, you know, yes. that is similar and, and that is yeah. already being bypassed as we speak. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, if I can, if I can add uh, something to that, uh, in general, if we look at the credit card fraud area, uh, I would say that the implementation of secure code is one of the factors why, at least in Europe, we see the credit card fraud is dropping 
at the moment. So I think that is one of the measures that actually makes it uh, more difficult for the criminals to operate. And that not being said that this will be the, the final uh, battle that will be fought here. There will be many, but, uh, but we see a significant drop uh, due to merchants are implementing these, let's say, text messages and, and NEMID or whatever codes that, that comes up actually uh, change the fraud landscape. But what will happen here is that the criminals then will turn to what is the next weakest link and then they will just push us there. And in five years time, the secure code is not that secure anymore. And then they move around and do something else. But that is definitely an area where I see a change in the fraud trends. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, talking about what kind of the secret weapon would be, uh, the silver bullet, that, that is that's really difficult to establish. But I think that one of the things that... Uh, that will help, and also in the future, uh, after that, uh, Frosters figure out how to bypass the, uh, the OTPs, then that is to understand what is normal for your customers. So you would be able to kind of build a baseline on, you know, how do they normally navigate in your app? What are they normally doing? Is does whatever they're doing now does that fit to what you know about this customer? But it's easier said than done. Uh, I can also uh, reveal that, but it, I think that that is the secret weapon because let's say that my card is compromised, then uh, forces they could go anywhere where they wanted to buy something, but it would be very hard for them to guess where I have well, well, where I use my card normally. So they would have a hard time mimicking my behavior. Uh, and so uh, we need to think of that as the secret weapon. It will not be the silver bullet, but it will help us a lot. All right. Um, so, I mean, uh, I think it's about time for us to actually close this disc this discussion because uh, we've been two hours online. Uh, the one to uh, uh, well, I, I I think it's been a very interesting discussion so far, uh, and I would like to 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 close it. Um, but maybe if people want to hang out, want to network, uh, we can uh, we can keep this channel open. And we can maybe close the, the YouTube channel to, uh, so, so that we have a more cozy conversation if you want. Uh, please feel free to, to stick around. Um, uh, I would really want to, to thank you for, for this, actually. Uh, the, these are insights that I don't normally get to, get to see firsthand. Uh, it's great that we have... Uh, you, uh, your perspectives from uh, from mobile pay and from uh, Danske Bank, uh, they uh, they they give uh, room for thoughts that uh, that would not be possible just by uh, having normal life as a user. Um, yes. So if anybody wants to join here, shall we just share the link? Yeah, yeah. You, you can paste the link in the YouTube. Yes. So let me do that. But uh, what, while we're waiting, uh, I have a question, uh, by the way. One thing I've wondered is that you, you've talked a lot, of, a lot about language barrier, and, and I'm sure that is a factor, but how about the MID digital signature, signature factor? I mean, we've had a digital signature, to, signature since 2003, and, and I mean, no matter how you put it, that must, have been, that must have meant something as well in terms of how much Denmark is protected, right? Yes, uh, I would say the whole thing about identity theft and all that kind of stuff, if we compare us to a lot of other countries, and, and, and this is the whole thing about bank ID and NIM ID that has been issued by government or, or, or banks, we are definitely, compared to a lot of our other areas, one step ahead. So when I talk to my colleagues, for instance, in UK, they are very keen of actually knowing more about uh, how NIM ID or bank ID is used, how we actually manage to get people convinced that they should use this uh, and actually are using it. And the whole digitalization of, of uh, users, they envy us a lot on, um, on that setup, especially with, let's say, identity theft. Uh, Suna, anything you would add to, to this one? 
I think that the, that you're right on that one, and I think that maybe it, it would be fair to say that uh, that the synthetic IDs does not really exist in the Nordics due to our digital identities. What we have is not identity theft; it's more like abuse of identities. You know, because we we don't very often see cases where someone stole a whole identity and bought a house and took up a loan and bought a car and you know, the full package as, as you could experience uh, somewhere where you don't have the digital identity. So yes, it has helped. But then on the other hand, we are just so much more digital in the Nordics than the rest of the world. So our exposure on the internet is also significantly higher than, uh, than the rest of the world. So I think, you know, yes, it helped, but, but the balance also shifted because everybody is online in the Nordics. So, you know, there's a lot of targets for, for the criminals. So, so yeah, I think that, um, I, I think that what is really interesting is to, is to share the knowledge of our digital identity. So the rest of the world don't believe that they will have peace the moment that they have a digital identity, because that is not going to happen. But I mean, one thing that surprised me a lot is that I learned recently that Canada doesn't even have have mandatory two-factor authentication on, on banks, on on the online banking. Yeah, that is uh, unbelievable in 2020, right? <laughs> that, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, but even though if you go to uh, uh, North America in in general, this is uh, that that's that's a lot of stuff here talking about customer, let's say, convenience. And uh, and then the liability of fraud is just put, let's say, towards the financial institution, and is part of, let's say, the, the 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 license to operate. So so uh, again, it has a lot to do with culture. And 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 I remember back in the days when we were talking about the whole thing about uh, using your credit card, and it was a chip and pin. Um, uh, I think that uh, North America was one of the last areas where that was actually required in uh, in uh, a lot of areas uh, where it has been implemented for a lot of years in, in, in a lot of other parts of the world. So I think convenience is customer, yeah, customer convenience is really something that they value a lot in uh, in North America. And that I think that is one of the reasons why this is going so slow. But then you will have to make a lot of investment on, on, on the back end <laughs> to compensate <laughs> for that lack of security. Yes. I, I, I would not fund that, Ketil. You will need no, to work on no, that. No, no, neither would I. Neither would I. So, guys, are we? Uh, is anyone joining? Uh, the, or are we closing uh, around? The, uh, I, I, I think I, I think Alessandro is posting the link. Uh. Uh, I posted the link, but uh, it doesn't seem like uh, anybody uh, really wants to join here. Uh, <laughs> so, how but, many was actually on? Just click the link. Just click the no link. No danger. Join the conversation. Otherwise, uh, thanks a lot yeah. for yeah, uh, yeah, we are time today. It's I think. Well, welcome. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night.